welcome back to AM Northwest. Our next guest says hearing is a science and listening is an art, and her latest book will inspire us to listen more deeply. We welcome the author of Third Ear, Elizabeth Rosner. Good to have you with us. Hi, thanks for having what me. What does it mean, Third Ear? Well, you know, I know a lot of people are probably familiar with Third Eye, mm -hmm. which isn't really an organ so much as a concept or a metaphor, and so Third Ear is really about listening with all of our senses and our entire bodies, really, to feel our hearts, to feel how our skin might prickle, and also to just tune into everything around us, even if we can't detect the literal frequencies through our ears. What inspired you to write a book about listening? I've been listening all of my life. I grew up in a family where there was a lot of noise. Yeah. <laughs> Not because there were so many of us, but because so many different languages were spoken in the house. My mother spoke seven. Wow. Three of those languages she shared with my father. We all spoke English together, but there were secrets and whispers. Wow. And there was a lot that was hidden in a way. My parents sure. were both Holocaust survivors, and so there were stories they told and stories they withheld. So I think I was always listening underneath right. and sort of around the corner. And then I also spent a lot of time in the woods and underwater. I really loved connecting with the natural world. And so over time for this book, I was thinking about what were the times in my life where a sound was a threshold moment for me? How was I changed by something I heard or wanted to hear? For instance? Well, there's a story in the book about the time I heard whale song underwater. Oh my gosh, yeah. that must have been incredible. It was life changing. Yeah. It was literally a, a before after right. experience where I didn't know that my own ears could pick that up. Yeah. I thought you needed special equipment or. How did this happen? I, you know, I was on a snorkeling trip mm -hmm. in Maui, off the coast of Maui and the captain of the catamaran dropped a hydrophone into the water and said there are humpbacks nearby. And I was kind of skeptical because I had heard whale song recordings on records. Sure. I didn't know that you could hear them live somehow. Right. And later that day, I was snorkeling and I dove under the water to follow a turtle, a sea turtle. Love sea turtle. Oh, yeah. I'm, they're kind of my spirit animal yeah, or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. I was following this turtle and I heard the same sounds that I had heard through the hydrophone. Wow. And I was so stunned to realize, not just, wow, I can hear them, right. but that I felt like I was eavesdropping on them. You know, they were miles away from me. Right, they were having a conversation. With each other. Right. It wasn't for me, it wasn't right. about me, you know? And so it was very humbling too. It was like there's this universe of communication going on and like I said, I felt like everything after that was about my recognition that I'm very small, but I can pay right. big attention. Well, you talk about wordless communi mm -hmm. communication, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, and you grew up in a, you mentioned a household where people are speaking different languages, mm -hmm. but, but talk about, like you mentioned too, walking in the woods mm -hmm. and listening, but yeah. those aren't words you're listening to. Right. You know, there's a lot of debate, I guess you could call it debate or disagreement in the scientific community or in the linguistic community about whether you can call what trees are doing. Because they speak to each other. Well, see, that's the thing. Yeah. I think they do. Yeah. Indigenous cultures believe this and right. have believed it for thousands of years. Scientists are always being very precise and wanting to know, well, is this language? Can you call it language? And I'm not that interested in whether you call it language, but I do call it listening. I think that the signals they're sending and receiving are very subtle and very nuanced. And when trees are sharing nutrients or sharing defense mechanisms, I think that's a form of listening. Yeah. That's what I'm calling it. And so when I'm observing them in a deep way, I'm listening to their listening. And again, it's not just with ears, right? right? Sometimes it's eyes, sometimes it's a, a sense of texture or touch. And, and I think the more we do that, the more we recognize that we're not the only ones speaking to each other. You know, yeah. um, all of the world is in communication. What can we learn from your book that we can use and put into action? Is it listening to people better? <laughs> well, you know, 
during the years that I worked on this book, gathering all of this research and then reflecting on my own childhood and upbringing, I would tell people I'm writing a book about listening and they would automatically say, oh, we need more of that. Like, people need to be better at listening yeah. to each other. And I agree, but I think my big hope for the book as a takeaway is that there's a lot that can happen when we just get quieter not just with each other, sure. not just when somebody else is talking, just stay present with them and don't just be thinking about what you're gonna say next, right. but really stay fully present with them. That practice can be when you're alone, oh. out on the beach, right. in the woods, in your backyard, walking somewhere. It, it doesn't just require another human being to be present, that you can be present with everything around you. And during the pandemic, we noticed this, that when everything got quieter, when the world got quieter, yeah. people heard themselves differently. Yeah. People heard the natural world differently. And so that's my hope, is that it doesn't take some kind of catastrophe right. <laughs> for us to get quieter and, and slow down and pay attention in, out, in, out. You know, the third year listening practice isn't just, um, how can I be a better listener? Right. It's like, how can I work with calming my whole nervous system down and sure. just feeling healthier and a, a better sense of present well-being? As you mentioned, you did a lot of research mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. what, did, what surprised you the most? You know, many things surprised me. I got to say, I, you know, a couple of things that really stand out are... Um, the long gestation for elephants. So elephants are in utero for almost two years. And during Poor that Poor elephants. I know, right? The moms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But what's happening in utero for elephants and also for humans, we're mammals, um, is that we're listening in utero. And so the elephants who do a lot of listening through the soles of their feet, they have the huh. soles of their feet pressed against the lining of the womb they're listening through their feet wow. in utero. Wow. And that, to me, I mean, mind-blowing. Yeah. Like, again, life-changing yeah. information, but also to recognize that there are people who talk about listening, like Pauline Oliveros, who I mention in the book, she recommends that we, that we walk barefoot in the woods and pretend or imagine that we can listen through our feet wow. also. I love that. You have a book event tonight at Powell's, I do. which is very exciting. Yeah. That's at seven o'clock at Powell City Books downtown on West Burnside. We're gonna put all the information for everyone on our website at k2.com. The book again is Third Ear. Elizabeth Rossner, thank you so much. It's a pleasure, thanks for having me. All right, we'll be right back with more AM Northwest, don't go away.